How's everybody doing this morning? Great to see you. I love that song. He is for me. You know, the simple little things sometimes that we forget that God is for me. He's for you. You know, sometimes through all the stuff that we're going on right now, you forget. And you start thinking about your circumstance. I know there's people that you, you're probably connected to people that are dealing with losses of jo- loss of job, COVID, just everything out there. And it just, it lifts me up when I think that God is for me and that God is really looking for me. How about you? Anybody? Maybe that's, that was just a word for some of you that are here today, just to, to know he's reminding you, I'm for you. I go beside you. I go in front of you. I go behind you. When I first came into the ministry, the, the scripture that they gave to me, he said that he would be a wall of fire around me. And that reminds me when I hear those, those, wor- those words from that song. And what we're, if, you're, if you're here today, we're going to talk about, really we're talking about disciple, discipleship this morning. Uh, our church's vision is transform lives that transform the world. And we believe that we do that by winning people to the Lord, by connecting them to the family of God, and then by discipling them into the, the truths and precepts of God, and then finally by sending them. So, you know, like somebody, some people are like, wait a minute, you're going to, I just got here. Yeah, you're not being sent today. But we do believe that God has the church functioning so that we can equip people with the word of God so that they could be sent into all areas of the world, all areas, everywhere. Now, before you get nervous, not everybody's called to the pulpit ministry, full-time ministry, right? Because I, I believe that the kingdom needs doctors and lawyers and engineers and the kingdom needs counselors. And the, so, so your send might look different than someone that's in full-time ministry, but it's still a send. It's still a mission field. The whole world is a mission field. You don't have to really go overseas, especially in Katy, Texas, one of the most diverse cities in the country. You can run into uh, all the nations of the world right here in Katy, Texas. Go to, go to Katy Mills Mall and you'll see. We're diverse. I mean, it's changed. Mission field has come to us. And we've got all kinds of culture and different people, right? I want to tell you a story. When you're talking about discipleship, we're going to be in 2 Timothy 2, so you have your Bible you can go to 2 Timothy 2. That's what we're going to that's what we're going to preach out of. But uh, before I was a pastor, I ran factories and so I I was in the corrugated box industry and when I got that job, I was in it for about 15 years, but when I first got the job, I didn't know anything about anything. Has anybody ever gotten put in a position where you know nothing about what you're about to lead? <laughs> I was hired as a leader. And, you know, I'd go out there, I didn't, know what, I didn't know what was what. So the first thing that I did is I got mentors. I became the leader of this big organization that was making boxes all over the world, all over the country. We even shipped overseas. You would think that they'd have a box company overseas, but we, had, we actually shipped overseas. But the important thing is that I got a mentor. And, and so this mentor, he knew a lot. Of, he was a retired guy that knew a lot about machinery and how the machinery ran. And so I, I, at that time, early on, I was kind of like a plant manager. So I managed all the, the situations that came up. And we, let, let me just give you an example. Like something would break. I'd have a problem with the machine. I couldn't get it to run. So I'd pick up the phone and I'd call my mentor and I'd say, hey, here's my issue. It's doing this. It's doing that. It's not doing this. And you, do you know that that guy never gave me an answer? He would never tell me, oh, it's this. He would tell me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into the cabinet, and I want you to measure the voltage from here to here, and I want you to do this and do that and do that. And when you've done all that, call me back. And you know that when I would go in there and I would start doing what he said to do, I would end up figuring it out without him telling me. That's a mentor. Okay, so like now, now let's get out of the box business and let's get into discipleship. <laughs> Same thing. So one of the problems that we have with discipleship in the church is we think we want to sit with somebody and go through a book and tell you to fill in the blanks 
and that that's going to mentor you somehow. But in reality, what you need is you need to discover that answer for yourself. In the Bible, listen, you, you, even if you have children, you want them to discover things, not just learn from instruction, of, from instruction. Right? Some things you cannot learn from, from instruction. I believe that one of the greatest things that we need in the church today is mature, equipped believers that can help impart into younger believers. That, that's the need in the church. We, we don't really need another system. We don't need another building. We need mature, equipped believers, be, people that have been walking with God, not just, not just knowing the word of God, but actually walking the word of God. Can, there's a difference. When you get somebody in your life that has walked and is walking the word of God, you've got, a, you've got something in front of you that you can see, that you can apply. You can, you can figure out what that scripture means because he's living it out in front of you or she's living it out in front of you. How many of y'all would desire someone in your life like that? I mean, everybody would, really. You desire somebody like I can look up to, they, they, you know. Now, they can't become God to you. But in 2 Timothy, listen, let me give you, 2 Timothy 2, let me give you a little context. This is the last book that Paul wrote in his life. He died shortly after writing 2 Timothy. A lot of people don't know that. They think that the last book was Revelation. But chronologically, for Paul's epistles, it was the last book that Paul wrote. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that he wrote that book to a son? I, I, I think it's very important for us to understand that while we, listen, we have kids, if you're a parent in here, it would be like, what would be the last thing you would write to your child if you knew that your time was over? And wouldn't you think that that child, when they received that letter and they knew that your time was about to be short, they would take that thing and say, these were the last things that my daddy told me. They must be important. They must have a weight you understand? They have a different kind of a weight when, when you read it in that context. So every time you read 2 Timothy now, remember Paul's confined to prison. He's in a circumstance where he can't get to his son and he's saying, I'm going to go. I know that I'm going. I feel like I'm going. I feel like it's going to be over soon. Here's some key things that you've got to know. And, the, and in 2 Timothy 2, the key thing, he says, and the things, listen to, listen to this, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's a picture of discipleship. It's a picture of Barnab Paul had Barnabas as a mentor. Timothy had Paul. And then there were faithful men and there were others. It was a generational, like that song was talking about children and children and their children. It was a generational idea of saying, I need you. Listen to me, church. He's saying this to us today. I need you to mature. I need you to mature because there's people that are coming up underneath you that are going to need you. I don't need you to stay in a place where you need somebody all the time. Listen, if you're there, God bless you, and, we're, and, and somebody will be there for you. But they're not just there for you to help you. They're there for you to get you to a place where you can teach another person. That's the kingdom of God. That's the purpose of discipleship is to grow and mature people to a place where you can be a help to somebody. Not just latched on, wanting help all the time. But that happens, you know. We all came in that way. See, Paul was like a, a spiritual father to Timothy. I shared this in the first service. I, when I first came to this church, I think I came, I was a week here. One week. I walked the altar to this. So I'm a product of this ministry. So what, whatever I'm telling you, I used to sit in the audience. I, I, got, I got transformed here to, to, to more... I got transformed here by God. When I first came in here, and I'm going to, you know, <laughs> I, got, I came to the altar. And, and, you know, my wife and I, we had a pretty good marriage. But we still had our little stuff, you know. We were having kids. My, my oldest was four. We hadn't had my second one. And so we were, we were learning. How many of you all know that there's no class for marriage? If there is, please let us know so that we can get signed up. 
There's no class for marriage and there's no class for raising kids. Two of the most important things that you'll ever do in your life. Maybe the church ought to teach on that. So I came in here and, I, and some guy came behind me and he prayed for me and he said, hey, let's have breakfast next week, Saturday. I was like, let's do it. So I went and had breakfast. He bought me eggs and bacon. He bought it. You know, I was like, yo, free breakfast? I'm there. Come on. I mean, you know me. And I'm eating my eggs and, and I'm talking about how, you know, if we, if, if we could just, if I could just get my wife to, to just, you know, not nag me so much and just kind of... Just, if I could just get my wife to do this and do that, and I'm talking the whole time. This guy's cutting his eggs, just probably just putting up with me, you know, like listening to me. Like, and I'm just complaining about this and complaining about that. And at the end of the eggs, my, I, my eggs were finished, and he's like, man, I know what the problem is. And I was like, well, great. Tell me the problem, and I'll get her to change, and we can get this thing fixed. <laughs> this is my wife, by the way, Miss Yolanda. And he looked at me straight, now I'd only been here a week. He looked at me straight in the eyes and he said, you're the problem. He said, you're the problem. Now, I've only been here a week. I ain't, I'm not planted here. I mean, everything in me, my flesh, I was like, I don't need this. I wanted to give him five bucks to pay for the eggs and just get out of there. But the Holy Spirit held me there. Because he, he told me, you're, you're the problem, and I know the answer, and I can help you. But the first step is you got to understand you're the problem. Now, not, some of you might not agree with that, that, but it changed my life. It changed my life from being in manufacturing to preaching the gospel. That's how much it changed my life. And it took a, a mentor it took somebody with boldness. See, everybody wants a mentor as long as they'll move you along. And, man, you're great. Come on, man. You're the best thing. You, you're so good. Man, I, I love hanging out with you. But the minute you get a mentor that says, hey, I need to do a little cutting in you. I need to remove some. There's some things that you're doing that are not right. And along, do, you, do you know that along the way, all of the mentors that I've had have had to correct me? All my life. I'm not speaking of something from a pulpit to a, to a congregation asking you to do something that hasn't already been done to me and doesn't continue to be done to me. It continues. I continue to allow myself to get on the table, the surgery table, the surgery room, and allow a man to say, what do you see in me, man? What do you see in me that's, that's killing me? What do I not see about me? That's discipleship. And, and I love this because he says, the things, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. When there's a witness, that means there's somebody that saw something, right? When there's a witness, there's people that have seen something. So Paul is saying, I not only instructed you in things, but I, I opened my life up to you so that you could see the witness of the things that I'm instructing you with. So that you can know that when I say we've got to love everybody, that you're watching me love everybody. So that when I say, hey, you've got to, you, you, you've got to do, you know, you got to tithe, you're watching me and I'm tithing. When I say you've got to serve, you're watching me and I'm not sitting at home not serving, I'm serving. When, I, when, when you come to my house and I say you've got to love your wife, you've got to serve her, then when you come to my house, I'm serving my wife, I'm, I'm loving my wife. That's the power of a mentor. See, outside of that, all you have is a teacher. And uh, he, said, I, he says, though you have 10,000 instructors, you have not many fathers. See, a father will let you in his life. A father will open the door to his home and say, come on in, come on. I, a father will take you in. A father will give you what you need when you need it. But a father will also put you out when you need to get put out. Everybody wants a father until they get one. Everybody wants a father until you get one. And then when you get one and he's nice to you and he's helping you and he's encouraging you and then he sees something, like you left your socks out, you left your shoes out, and he trips on them. This didn't happen in my house, but I'm just saying. I slid on them. You know, you do that little, I have tile. You step on a Lego. 
That's better. He, listen, the first thing that you got to understand about this scripture, everybody, you know how you use the quotations? Everybody go like this and say, these things. These, he says, these things. He said, these things that I've instructed you with in a, 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 amongst in the presence of witnesses that you've seen me live out. These things that I live out not only with you, but with everyone else that sees me. These things that I know. Don't you think we ought to know what, the, what are these things? They're the truths of God. The precepts of God. How will you know the precepts of God unless you're in his word and you're reading his word and you're searching his word and you're understanding that, you know, like today as we're singing this song today and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this proclamation over my family and my children and their children and their children and God is faithful. All I could think was he, God was the Holy Spirit was saying, just be faithful. Just I don't know what to do, Lord. Be faithful. When you don't know what to do, attend, serve, tithe. Do what you know to do. Don't recluse back into the corner scared of what's happening in your life. What do you know to do? I'm listening to this song and God is, 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 is showing me. I need you to have faith like that, proclaiming things that are as if they aren't. And I just need you to be faithful, faithful. Faithful every day, faithful every day. Get up, spend time with me every day. I don't feel it, Lord. It doesn't matter. It's not about feeling. It's about being faithful. Faithfulness is not necessarily attached to a feeling. It's attached to a choice and a commitment. See, he, he put, let me, hold on a second. So he said these things. He says, I want you to know these things, but I want you to live these things. Now, listen to me. Everybody's in here hearing about what a mentor should be like, and you're thinking of someone else, but I'm really talking to you. You're thinking about how can I get a mentor. I'm, talking, I'm saying, why don't you be a mentor? But, but, but I don't ha you have everything that you need because all you need is faithfulness, and God will teach you the rest. But if you're not faithful, he... You can't move forward. Have anybody ever taught their kids how to ride a bike? Anybody in here? Like you ran behind the bike. Okay. Do you know in that bike, when I bought my kids bikes, they came in a box. And I was so cheap that I didn't want them assembled. I wanted to assemble them at home because I didn't want to pay the extra 75 bucks to get it done. So I put them together and they always came with a manual. And in that manual, it showed you how to put it together. But also there was a section in there called operation. How to operate the thing you just purchased. How silly would it be for me to take my five, six, seven-year-old and give them the bike, put it together, give them the bike, and give them an instruction manual and say, honey, uh, read the manual. It's all in there. <laughs> and it, it tells you where the pedals are and what they are and how to move them and how to brake. And it tells you how to turn and it tells you what you need to do. Have fun. I'm going to go inside and watch TV. That's not, if you're a parent, you know, that's not how you teach a kid how to ride a bike. There's pain involved of running after the bike and being out of wind. Because you don't do, am I the only one? I'm, 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 I was out of shape. One thing I realized when I was teaching my kids how to ride bikes is how out of shape. Now listen, when Ashlyn, she's 24 now, when Ashlyn was four, it was easy because I was, I was younger. But when Amherst came around, I, I, I was older. It was harder. But I had to get my, my, my daughter on the bike. I had to convince my daughter that that bike wasn't going to hurt her. That's not in the manual. There's certain things in the, in the manual, but there's certain things in the practical application of the manual that you won't get unless you're in it. And if I don't know how to ride a bike, I can't teach somebody how to ride a bike. And so I can tell you all about it. How many of you, I'm not talking about riding bikes now. I can tell you all about how to be discipled and how to be this and how to do that, but I'm unwilling to submit myself to anyone else to be discipled. Mm, you don't really know what you're asking them to do. 
You can call yourself a disciple but not be submitted. And now you're, you're asking people to, you're saying you need to submit to me. But you're not submitted to no one. Right? In, in marriage, it's, okay, this is a little off, but in marriage, the Bible says that I'm the head of the house. I got to take care of her. I got to, I got to die for her. I've got to be like Christ to the church. Right? Is that right? Does Ephesians 5 say that? That the husband is the head of the, of the wife. But listen, we look at headship and we want position and authority, but really we're accountable for the entire family. And really what it is is I'm, I'm, I'm called to die for my wife and my children for anything. I'm, a, I'm the protector. I guide, I guard, and I govern. And I take that on, right? And then I ask, and then the Bible says that she submits to that. Because of my sacrifice for her, she wants to, she doesn't, she's not forced to submit. She's not forced to submit to, she wants to submit to me because of, of what I sacrifice. Do you see how that works? But we'll take that teaching and we we'll want to force everybody into position. And God said, I never meant it to be positional, to be forced into. I made it to be heart. I made it, I made it for her to look at you and say, man, I love that guy so much, I can go anywhere with him. And you know why she can go anywhere with me? Because as I ask her to submit, I'm also submitted. So I have people in my life, more than one people, person in my life, in fact, they were all texting me last night. All my mentors, I don't know why, they all texted me something last night. I have people that, 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 that will call me out and say, hey, you need to do, hey, this is not good. Because I have that in my life, it's easy for her to say, if you'll submit yourself to them, I'll submit myself to you. You see how that works? But listen, men don't want to submit to nobody. But there's a power in discipleship. There's a power in having a spiritual father, spiritual parents, somebody above you that can help you, that is not lording over you. They're in it for you. They're for you. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it, get, it, can, get, it can get out of hand if you think, if, if, you, if you're trying to have position over people. But this is about heart. This is about, when I, when I look at my family, I want to die for, I'm going to die for them. I committed, to, I chose to say, I'm willing to die for you. So the pattern of scripture is for a mature believer to help a younger, a younger believer. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful, faithful to others. Four generations. Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful faithful to others. It's made to be a generational discipleship process. It's not just about right now. It's about what's coming. He says, commit to faithful men. He's, so you got to know the things and you got to be able to live the things. Then you've got to commit to faithful men. I love it. In this scripture, Dr. Cole uses this scripture and he, he, he says, God purposely put faithfulness in front of ability. Right? Because he said, I, how many of y'all know that most of the time in our organizations and, and in the world, we look for talent. And we, we place people in places of leadership because of talent. God says, don't do that. God says, first look at faithfulness. Because Dr. Cole says, you can take a faithful man and you can make him able, but you cannot take an able man and make him faithful. Did you hear that? You can take a faithful man and you can equip him and make him able, but if he's not faithful, you can't make him faithful. He can have all the talent in the world. How many, how many of us have seen guys with extreme talent get elevated to places of leadership, but their character is so bad that it can't sustain the level of leadership that God puts them in? You see these young kids playing sports, and they got some great talent, but they're uncoachable. They're unteachable. They've, they've relied on their talent to get them wherever they're at. They got the attitude like that coach ought to be happy I'm on this team. If it wasn't for me on this team, this team wouldn't win. Wrong. Wrong. 
He said, faithfulness is the first step. After becoming born again, faithfulness is the first step. So how, so we know that these things are the things, the principles and the truths in the Bible. What is faithfulness? How do you measure faithfulness? Let me give you an example. This is not the only way, but this is how we do it at Powerhouse Church. If you've been here for any time at all, if you've gone through our membership class, what I ask people that say, I want to be a member of this church, I ask them to do three things. I ask them to attend, like come to church. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be a member, you would come, right? That's not a lot. You're saying, I want to be a part of this, you're going to be here. You're going to serve. You're going to find something to put your hand to. And the last thing is you're going to tithe. You're going to support it financially and contribute to the things that we do as a church together to fulfill the vision of God that he's given to us. Did you know that none of those things require talent? They require no skill. To attend, to serve, and to tithe requires nothing except your decision and your choice and your commitment. God levels the playing field. He says, I don't need you to be something. I just need you to choose and commit. And that, that's an expression of a faithfulness. Is that the only expression? No, but that's ours. That's what the Lord's given us. So when somebody says, I want to lead a life group, I was like, well, do you attend, serve, and tithe? That's step number one. Are you a member of the church? I mean, I can't put you in charge of people. To, to, to minister to people, to open your home and bring people in if I don't know you're faithful. It's not about the money. It's not about the serving. It's about the faithfulness. It's about the faithful. Can, can I try? Are, are you in that month? Are you, will you contribute? Are you part of this family? And then we can look to equip you to lead. So our all-in process is basically a measurement of faithfulness. Faithfulness prepares us to be entrusted with the next level of truth. Luke 16, Jesus, listen, if you have a Bible that's a red-letter Bible, this is in red. He says, how, if I cannot, if you cannot be trusted with, worth, with worldly wealth, then how can I entrust you with the true riches of the kingdom? And he says, and how will you, if you're, if, you're, if you're faithful with worldly wealth, then I will give you that which is yours. It's in red, Luke 16. Even Jesus was saying, how you handle your worldly materials. Listen, it's not just about money. It's, it's time, talent, treasure. It's not money. It's time, talent, treasure. Treasure. Some people can write checks all day long, and, but they will not give you your time, their time and they will not give you their talent. So one out of three doesn't work in the kingdom. God, Because God's not looking at money or he's not looking just at that. He's looking at the whole. He's looking at, does, does, is he faithful? It's got quiet in here. God bless you guys. If you're visiting with us today, you don't have to give today. Just be blessed. We're glad you're here. This is not any kind of a ploy. I'm just teaching discipleship of what it looks like to be faithful. Do you understand? What so if you're visiting today, no obligation, just, just enjoy. This church is supported by those that have said, I'm going to attend, serve, and tithe. We've got them in the house today. They're here. They, they're the reason that we can do everything that we do all around the world and all around this community, all around Texas. The other thing he said, so he said, the, the things, you got to know the things. He says, you got to be faithful. I'm giving you the, the, the building blocks of discipleship. Get in your word and then make a choice to become faithful. And then he says, then, then I, that, that faithfulness will enable your spirit to be teachable. And to be able to handle the truth which enables abilities and capabilities. So the idea is if, if, if you can be faithful, you can be taught to be able. Let's, let's look at a, 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 an example of a business. Any business owners in here? Okay, good. 
So the first thing that you do, when there's a probationary period. You know, when you get hired, there's that probationary period. Everybody know what I'm talking about? You sign this, you know, 90-day probation. You know what they're trying to figure out? Are you faithful? Like, are you going to come to work on time? Are you going to be able to do the minimum thing that I said I hired you I could do? You don't need to know how to do everything because we're going to teach you how to do more than what you already know. But I hired you on the basis of the, that you were going to do something. You were going to serve. And then, I, I, and then are you productive? Which productivity is like the tie. It's like giving. Because what you're doing when you go, you trade your skill and they give you money for your skill. So what you take to the company, you, you don't necessarily give money to the company, but you give productivity to the company, which creates money for the company. Do you see? And in, the, if in those 90 days, you're always late. You're not going to make it. Can I get an amen from all the business owners? If in those 90 days, you're always taking a restroom break or a taco break or whatever kind of break you got to take, a smoke break. Not y'all because y'all are Christians and you don't, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding, buddy. I don't want to go there. If you're and and you're you're they're watching and they're saying, does this guy in that 90 day probation? I'm talking about a job. This is a job job, in the natural. This is in the natural. We're watching these 90 days. How are you doing? Can you, man? This guy's on time all the time. He's reliable. The Bible says that an unreliable man is like chewing with a broken tooth. In Proverbs, look it up. It's in there. Are you reliable? Are you faithful? Do you know everything you need to know? No. They knew that when they hired you. They said, hey, this guy, he doesn't know all the stuff that we do, but we're going to train him in it. But we got to make sure in these first 90 days that he's going to show up on time, that he's going to serve, that he's going he's to put everything into it, and he's going to be productive. All in. He's going to attend, serve, and tithe. Do you see the, the connection? That's in the natural, but God is saying that in the, in the church, he's looking for his people to be faithful. For his followers to say, I follow him, but not at a distance. I'm all in. So these things that we're talking about are foundational things. They... So we can't just agree with them in concept. We've got to be able to believe in them. And when you believe in them, it means that you walk in them. It means that you do it. So, so today, as, as I'm speaking and I'm talking about the things, that, the, the, the truths of God and the faithfulness of God and the abilities, my question to you is, do you have those, those, do you have those things in your life? Is there someone in your life that can speak into your life? I was telling somebody the other day, with discipleship, we put a lot of effort into the process of discipleship, sometimes too much. And I learned that if somebody really wants to be a follower of Jesus, it doesn't matter how bad your system is, they're going to learn about him. And they're going to follow him. And they're going to look for him. It doesn't matter how good your system is. And so many times in the church, we'd make this mistake. We, we say, everybody came to church today, so we, we, we're assuming everybody here wants to be a follower of Christ. But that's not the truth. The truth is there's some people here in different level area. There's different seasons of life. There's people here that are just here because they, may, they were made to come here. <laughs> Look straight ahead if that's you. Just don't give it up. Nobody knows who you are. Just don't give it up. And we get into this mindset in the church where if I say, man, if I create this funnel, this system, and I just get all of y'all to go through it, and then on the other side of it, I'm going to make a leader out of you. And that's, the, that's not true. Because some of them are going to fight to get in the process. Some of them are going to hang on to the fence. They're not going to want to shake off into the process. And so we've come to a place of, of following Christ. The Bible says that no man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
We never want to talk. We, we, we want total incl- inclusivity. That's a new word today is inclusive. We've got to be inclusive to everybody. But the Bible, listen, read your Bible. He says, unless you're willing to die to yourself, you can have no part of me. Unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you can have no part of me. If you put your hand to the plow and turn away from me, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. That's not me talking. That's Jesus. And we start thinking that we've evolved from this old book. And that this old book has become old and outdated. But the Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And for him to not be the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, we're in trouble. And we want to make this thing fit what we want it to fit. Because we want to be the Lord of our own lives, and we don't want a Lord over my life. And so we, we, we gather and we, 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 we change the system and we say, God is okay with me the way I am. But God never said he was okay with you the way you are. He loves you, but he came to change you. He came to, for you to deny yourself and die to the things that are not of him. He came for you to come to this book and say, I've got to line up to this. This doesn't line up to me. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm afraid that in the last day, when he comes back for his church, there's going to be a, a, a remnant only. There's going to be people that are going to say, didn't I do this for you and this for you? And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I've never known you. Because in our rebellion, we're unwilling to die to ourselves. In our rebellion, we're unwilling to follow him. In our rebellion, we want to be, we want to be who we want to be. And he's such a gentleman that he'll let you be that. So the gospel of Jesus is saying, I came and I paid for all your sinful, wicked thoughts and deeds and actions. And because I paid for you, I expected that you would be grateful. (laughs) I know God, I know, I know that God's not how we, we. It's hard for us to stomach that because we don't think God talks like that. We think that Jesus is going to come in the robe and just, come on, little children. Come on, little children. He's going to have eyes of fire when he comes back. He's the Lion of Judah. He is eternal, the eternal Son of God. You're going to bow down before him. You're not going to be able to speak. You're not going to, you're not going to share your case. You're going to be known as you're known, and you're going to know. You're going to know that you know that you missed it when you're there. I don't want that to be you. I don't want that to be you. That's why we win, connect, disciple, and send. We don't just do it to feed people. We feed people to get you in here to tell you this, that unless you die to yourself and you say yes to him, and he's you're the Lord of your life, you, you put him as Lord, not just Savior, Not just Savior, Savior and Lord. Lord means king. Lord means I bow to the king and I do the king's decrees and I follow the king how the king wants to be followed. It's not about me anymore, it's about him. That's what following Christ is like. And if it's too much, it's too much. I (sighs) Hey, is it 11.30? Good Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for pulling my eyes to the clock. My question to you, let's stand to our feet today as we close the service. You know, I like, I like the idea of not doing altar calls traditionally when we come to the front. I like the idea of you standing to your feet right where you are. Stand to your feet. And I like for the Holy Spirit to do something in you. So that you can't say, well, that guy, I went down there and he prayed for me. I want the Holy Spirit to do something in you. I'm tired of people being drawn to me, being drawn to a leader, being drawn. We can't give you anything. Only the Lord can give you what you need today. Only he can save you today. Only he can break rebellion off you today. Only he can. So right where you are, listen, just, just if that's you, if you've been pierced, listen, if you know if the Holy Spirit's been talking to you, if you've been pierced to the, to the heart by the word of God and you know, you know, listen, everyone in here, you know that you know him or you don't. Don't leave here without knowing him. 
Don't leave here without repenting. Don't leave the house of God without saying, you know what, God? I've been an idiot. That's okay. I know it's on live stream. Because I've been an idiot. Don't think too highly of yourself. Just come and say, Lord, I've rejected you. You died for me, poured your blood out for me to change me and transform me, and I've rejected you. I've rejected your ways. But right now, I'm seeing that I'm reject I've rejected you. I've walked away from you. I, I, I've had my hand to the plow, and I've turned away. Today, if there's any day, today you're, you know that tomorrow is not promised. If anything with this, with this COVID thing has happened, is it's been a divine inter interruption. It's been a divine interruption for the church to say, you're not in control. Only he's in control. And, the, and this life is not all that there is. There's an eternity forever. And you've got to know, he, the, 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 he didn't bring it. I'm not saying that he brought it. I'm just saying he's interrupted our regular stuff to say, wake up, church. Do you belong to me? Quit playing games with me. I came and I died for you. I bled for you. I took the whip for you. I came to set you free. And you keep rejecting me and pushing away from me. Man, if you need him, you need to just lift your hands and say, Lord, I'll forgive me. We need to repent. You need to repent right now. The whole church, we need to repent and say, Lord, I, forgive me for not being bold. Don't let yourself off the hook. Some of us are saying, well, I'm saved. Yeah, but you haven't been witnessing to nobody. You haven't been in your word and I don't know how long. You're still watching that stuff at 2 a.m. in the morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, for repentance to come to your church. Not just this church, but the whole church. Father, I pray that you raise up your sons and daughters. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you separate, Lord God, those that love you from those that don't. Father, I thank you for exposing us. I thank you for exposing us and where we are with you, for exposing rebellion. I come against it in the name of Jesus. It cannot stand in the name of Jesus. I come against every sickness and disease in Jesus' name. Father, let the signs, wonders, and miracles happen all over this world, but not for us, but to bring you glory, to show that you're still alive, that you're still there, that you still move. I pray, Lord God, that those that have taken you for granted would become to be grateful. Lead us to your heart, Lord God. Lead us to your heart. Man, if that's you and you made a decision today, I don't even want your name. I don't want to take up how many hands. You know why? Because what I want to see is a church on fire. You know how I know that we'll be working right? Not by tallying up how many people came up here, but, how, but that there's fire happening in the community, that there's people getting saved in the community, that the church begins to grow because the church is out there witnessing. That's how we know we win, not by a number. You might want to turn off the live stream eventually here because I feeling God is looking for his church to be discipled because there's people let me, get, let me tell you a quick story and I know I'm running out of time I, I, I promise this is the last one I was talking to Sri Lanka the other day and they went into a village and, and they were with Hindus the whole village is Hindu people and, I, and we have Max Man in Tamil, which is the Hindu language. And I said, Chaminda, do you have enough books to go in there? And he goes, well, I have plenty of books. The issue is the whole village doesn't read or write. This is 2020. The whole village doesn't read or write. So he's got to know these things in here. And he's got to walk in there and tell a story like in the old days. And tell them about this Jesus. And they're, they're hooked to him because they can't read or write. They don't have no internet out there. I know that's hard to believe. 
And this guy, I'm, I'm talking to a pastor, and I'm just humbled by it because I'm like, wow. I'm over here like trying to buy another mic and <laughs> trying to get another screen. This dude's just trying to tell the story out of his mouth, tell a story and tell it in a way that it would penetrate and pierce. He's relying on the Holy Ghost. In a whole nother, at a whole nother level, he's relying on the Holy Ghost. You get to go home. How many of y'all have 10 Bibles at your house that you don't open? Come on. America. America. You got the big white one that you got when you visited the other big church. And then you got all these little Bibles. We got, we got the word all over us in our offices, in our, on our bedside. And we, we struggling with reading it. And these people can't even read it. And when he shows up once a month, he, they show up with an expectancy saying, what's he going to tell us today about this Jesus guy that I've never heard about? It's another world. It's another world and it's happening right now, 2020. This ain't, a, this ain't an old book. This is not from an old book. This is on the conference call Friday with my pastor over there. So just be encouraged today.